Welcome back to another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, here today in Erlanger, Kentucky, and I'm joined by a former, um, well, I guess I would call you like a former, you were president, you were vice president, and now yeah. you're an active member. Yeah. Paul, Paul Dusing, thank you so much um, for being here on behalf of the Erlanger Historical Society. So right out of the gate, tell us how Erlanger was settled. Well, okay, that's a long story and complicated, but uh, a long time ago in uh, 1785, it was nothing but wilderness. And uh, the territory of Virginia willed or gave uh, 2,000 acres to a Robert Johnson and uh, John Watkins, and they were from Virginia. In 1793, Kentucky legislature passed uh, an act to create a wagon trail from Frankfurt to Cincinnati. And it remained, the whole place remained uh, desolate in the 1800s. It was first leased, some property was leased to a Bartlett Graves in 1808, and he's the first record recorded taxpayer in uh, the city. Plantation farming was what he did, and um, he had slaves, and um, um, they built a large, um, plantation type home and uh, they built the roads uh, the houses close to the roads so that they were uh, able to get around uh, those that followed him uh, the Stansfords, the Timberlake, the Bettinger, Mr. Buckner, the Riggs uh, they all did the same thing they built homes uh, close to the road and they had slaves and they did plantation type farming and uh, the road itself was improved in the 1840s for farmers to move products uh, from their farm to the markets in Cincinnati. And of course, like everything else, uh, somebody had to pay for it, so there were toll booths. And uh, the toll takers, they got paid a little bit, and then they were responsible for the maintenance. So that's how things got started in the city of Erlanger. So Paul, every city has like this like one thing that made them a thriving community. What was that for Erlinger? Without a doubt, transportation. All right, let's talk about it. Um, as the, the community developed, uh, a, a road was made and uh, for people to get around, it was just dirt and stone. So we were subject to the weather. Yeah. But uh, in the 1800s, it was just dirt and stone. And of course we had toll booths and people tried to take care of it. Um, and then came the train in 1877. Uh, City of Cincinnati built the railroad uh, to Ch from here to Chattanooga, and it had to come right through Erlanger. So the train had to stop in Erlanger to get water because by the time they got out of Ludlow and climbed the long hill, the train uh, needed water for the steam engine. Mm -hmm. So they had to stop here anyway. So that started growth. Uh, in 1921, this dirt road and stone road was paved thanks to the federal government. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> that made, believe it or not, Route 25, Route 42, and uh, Route uh, 127 all go right through the center of Erlanger. Wow. And naturally with all that traffic there, people started developing businesses. And then uh, the bus system was started in 1919 by Mr. Bentler. And uh, that was at the corner of Dixie Highway and Donaldson Road. And he started a bus that ran from here to Fort Mitchell. Mm. And if you wanted to go from Fort Mitchell to Cincinnati, you got off of his bus and onto the Green Line and then went to Cincinnati right. and came back and do it in reverse coming back. And then came the expressways. And we have I-75, I-71, and I-275 all go right through our community. And that brings a whole lot of traffic. Um, traffic from three states all merge right here in Erlanger. Hmm. And uh, it caused a lot of traffic and of course a lot of business. And then there's the airport, which is less than five miles away. It's, it's Cincinnati International Airport. It's five miles away. And uh, as you know, it, it's just one of the thri most thriving places going right now. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're continuing to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. So trains seem to be like the predominant mode of transportation. Can we talk in detail a little bit more about that? It was very uh, active uh, at the beginning. It caused uh, a great number of things to happen. Uh, 
not necessarily more than the rest, but it, it, it was very interesting the way it developed. Uh, in February 12th of 1874, I think it was, Erlanger <clears throat> uh, was told that the city uh, trustees uh, in Cincinnati were going to build a railroad. And it was going to come right through Erlanger. So then I'm sure all the business people thought, wow, opportunity, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then um, they created this railroad. It was called the CNO and TP, which is Cincinnati to New Orleans and Texas Pacific. And uh, it still runs from, from here at Chattanooga under the name of Norfolk and Southern. Okay, okay. okay. And the railroads seem to buy each other out on a monthly basis, but uh, all the railroad assets, believe it or not, are still owned by the city of Cincinnati. Um, no, not many people know that. Yeah, I didn't you, know that. You have a hard time finding it on paper. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but it, it is, in fact, the railroad right away is leased. Yeah. Huh. And <clears throat> the property along the uh, railroad right here at Erlanger, it was so close to the track that some people um, donated property to the railroad in order to build the right of way and other property that they need. And uh, in return for giving this property away, the, the uh, property owners were given lifetime railroad passenger privileges. Now, that was only for the family members okay. for as long as they lived. Okay. And the last one, who was uh, still in the business, in the program, was um, Alice Hallam, Mary Alice Hallam. And she lived on Alice Street. And she exercised her passenger privileges to the max. She would have the train stop here frequently, and she would get on the train and ride to Lexington to shop. <laughs> and they okay. would bring her back. Okay, yeah. So, I'd and, say she maxed that out. Right. Yeah. And the railroad is still through here every day. Huh. So. Can you tell us how Erlinger got its name? Certainly. Um, at the beginning, uh, when the railroad was built, the Cincinnati to New Orleans, Texas Pacific Railroad mm -hmm. uh, was built in uh, 1876 and 1877. And that's when they started. And uh, that's when it started all taking place here in Erlanger. Uh, the depot uh, was built and the depot needed a water tower for the steam engines to get water when they climbed the hill out of Ludlow. So uh, once the depot was built, we started passenger service, of course. And then, um, the reservoir where the water came from was what we all here call Silver Lake. And the president of the board of trustees of the railroad was a Mr. Greenwood. And um, in the 1880s, the residents here who had come by then applied for a post office to be named Greenwood. Uh -huh. And whoever they applied to, um, they uh, rejected that name because they felt it was too common. And uh, then they went to the next best thing, and I think it was a good decision. Uh, Baron Frederick Emile d'Erlinger. Ooh, fancy name. Well, it's a correct pronunciation for the Frenchman. French. He owned the company, uh, a bank that held most of the, the leases on the railroad property. So him being an important guy, they applied in 1882. Uh, the earlier was accepted as the post office location. And um, the post office was located in what everyone here knows as the Benninger store or home on Crescent Avenue. Paul, can you talk to us about some of the notable homes remaining in the city of Berlinger? Absolutely. Uh, some of the architecture is amazing. Um, it's still around today. Um, one of the ones we have is the French's home uh, or referred to as the beaches. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming they had beech trees in the yard but it was called the Beaches. Um, it was built before the Civil War in 1854. And um, they had slaves and um, they were uh, traveling judges. The people who owned it, the Frenches, were traveling judges from Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Um, Richard and his son Charles lived there whenever they came here for legal matters. And then they had a daughter, um, Married, uh, she married a Timberlake, who was another prominent family here in the, in the uh, Erlinger area. And uh, that home has been owned by four or five people since it was built. Hmm. Uh, if this home, like a few others in the neighborhood in 1915, a tornado destroyed the whole home. 
Really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. 1915 was a wild year there, here at Erlanger. Okay. Yeah. All right. Wow. Okay. So, uh, did did that did that happen to destroy any of the other notable homes that absolutely. you know? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Paul, can you talk about the Barlett Graves home? Yeah, that's another one that was uh, pretty prominent. And it was referred to as Walnut Grove. Mr. Graves was the first citizen in Erlanger. And he's the first one on the tax records as having paid taxes in 1808. He was referred to as the High Sheriff. Hmm. That's quite a title. Mm -hmm. Of Campbell County, no less. Oh. Now, Campbell County. Well, in the 1800s, there was... Campbell County. Now it's Campbell, Boone, and Kenton. Okay, really broken up. Yeah, so it's broken into three pieces. So he was the high sheriff at that point. So uh, his first home was a brick structure, and it was near the Baptist Church on Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, this, unfortunately, like other homes in the area, burned down in 1895 uh, because they all he heated with fire in the fireplace, so they were fire prone. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. All right, well... Look, I've taken some time to go through Erlanger. I know there's a couple more homes that we can talk about. So, yes. Um, what, what's what's next on your radar? Um, the railroad station manager's house. Okay. Um, people probably don't know where it is or what it is because they don't have a sign out that says that. But it's at 3202 Crescent Avenue, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, right by our train depot. Uh, it was built by the CNO and TP Railroad for the station manager and his family. Okay. And the station manager was uh, Redmond Kelly. And they lived there uh, from 1910 to 1930. He also had three brothers that worked for that railroad. So it was a family business, kind of. And uh, this house still stands today. Uh, and it's in wonderful condition, taken well care of by the current owners. Good. Oh, uh, that's good to hear. Yeah. All right. Well, do we we have a little bit of time? Do you do you want to talk about any more of those notable homes? Well, there there are plenty. Uh, there <laughs> oh, are there are still plenty. Here. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna have to pick a little. Okay. Well, the the Buckner home. Okay. Which is um, that's a a prominent name here in the community. Buckner is uh, at Thirty Commonwealth. Okay. Now everybody who's gonna watch this will know that as the Lindemann Funeral Home. Okay. Everybody's going to say, oh, yeah. I know where that is. Right, right, right. right. And it's a beautiful place. And uh, it's they've had many additions and um, modifications and renovations uh, to this place since it was built. Uh, it was the original home of the Buckners, who were one of the first settlers uh, in the earlier area. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, another one comes to mind is the Land Syndicate Homes. Okay. Now, the Land Syndicate was created just to get people to come here to see what Erlinger has cr had created, and that was a subdivision. Aha. Uh -huh. Nobody had heard of that. I think we were one of the first in the state. Okay. Um, and the land syndicate brought people here from Cincinnati on the train to see these homes that they had built. Right. There are four currently still left in, in Erlinger, and people live in them. And uh, the... Uh, at 26 Center Street, I think it is, is, is one of the nicer ones. And uh, the Gray family, who they have lived in that home for 50 years. And um, despite any renovations they might have done since then, it still has stained glass windows, the original stained glass windows in it. That's amazing. Yeah, and it really is a nice looking place. Wow. Uh, another one is the F. W. Walton, I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me, F. Walton Dempsey home. Okay. And that's at 317 Graves. Okay. And uh, people can drive to these and see these. They're still there. Mr. Dempsey owned a Studebaker dealership in, in Erlanger. And appropriately, uh, a car dealership shows up right after the highway gets paved. Hmm. All right. So now people aren't afraid to drive a car on yeah. the, the dirt and stone yeah. roadways, you yeah. know. So the highway uh, was repaved. Uh, he and Congressman A.B. Rouse bought a Dixie Traction Company. Uh, the older folks here might know what that is. Uh, the current owner of the house here at 317 Graves is uh, Mr. and Mrs. James Viox. And Mr. Viox has been a city employee for a long time, and he's the city engineer. Oh, yeah, that's okay. A very popular name, very well known. Uh, the Timberlake home, that's another uh, 
prominent family name in the, in the area. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, everybody knows where the big white house is on Stevenson Road by the railroad tracks. Uh, it's a landmark. <clears throat> it was built by Thornton Timberlake. And four generations of people have lived in that house. And um, it, like the others, was damaged in the 1915 tornado. Yeah. It lost the whole second floor. And um, on the, uh, one of the, it was one of the first homes that was built between Covington and a trading post that was someplace near Florence. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, another one is the mansion. We call it the mansion or the Forest Lawn Mansion. Um, the Manly home. They're the ones that first owned it. Manly. And uh, it sits on the hill above the lake right there on the highway at this, by the cemetery. Uh, it, and it's a large federal style mansion built in 1852. And um, Manley and his wife, Margaret Johnson Manley, and two daughters came from Mississippi. Okay. And mm -hmm. they built the home, and they also had slaves in slave quarters, uh, which is a, a common practice here in the community. Yeah. And um, it was also owned by other names that are prominent in Erlanger, and that's uh, James Garvey, uh, Mrs. George Benninger, uh, Colonel Cody, and uh, now the current owner is the people who uh, manage and run the cemetery. And uh, they currently uh, have informed everybody that they're tearing down this beautiful place uh, due to the fact that it has fallen into disrepair and it's just cost prohibitive to keep it going. So right. we don't know what it's gonna turn into, but that's what's happening. Okay, all right. And you wanna to touch on any, mm -hmm. any other homes? Uh, uh, I think there's one more uh, that's um, really important okay. to this story. All right. Um, this, we're talking about the Howard Camp home at 319 Erlinger Road. Okay. And I have dubbed it the Annex. You have dubbed it the annex. Yes. Okay. Of city government. Okay. And I'll tell you why. I was gonna say this is interesting. Matthew Harcap owned a saloon and a restaurant in Covington. Okay. Yeah. And he served as a trustee on in Erlanger uh, in 1897. Mr. O. M. Rogers, and, uh, who was a state legislature and an attorney uh, for the city of Erlanger, bought this home in 1910. And Mayor Austin Mann owned this home. And uh, now Mr. and Mrs. Randy Blankenship own the home. Now Randy has been on city council and is a, an attorney also. And uh, we're in that home today. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating home. Now when you consider how many people have owned it and they've all worked for the city government in one way or shape or form, that's why I called it the annex. <laughs> I, I, I dubbed it interesting. In fact, it is yes. very much so. So we talked earlier about how transportation was like the one thing that Erlanger really kind of like thrived on. And so with that, of course, um, comes businesses. So let's talk about some of those businesses along the Dixie Highway. Okay. Some of the earlier ones. Yes. Okay. Um, some of them are still here. Um, in, Dixie, in 1921, I told you that the highway was finally paved, which brought more traffic. And with more traffic, people need a place to live. So the high the businesses that developed were like the Boone Kenton Lumber Company, mm -hmm. and that's still in existence and going strong. Erlanger Lumber is still here, but it's under a different name. Um, the Seven Mile House, it was a uh, an inn. It's okay. not. It's no longer here. The Dixie Club is a a very active place, and it uh, opened in 1930. And for the longest time until the 1970s, it was uh, pretty much men only. Yeah, and uh, it was remodeled, and the new owners uh, have it going uh, loud and strong, and everybody's welcome now. Mm, I like it. Yeah. Now, the Shaven family um, is one of the most prominent names in the community, and uh, everything has their name on it in one shape, way, shape, or form. Uh, they uh, got here in the 1890s. Okay. And they... Um, had a hardware store at the corner of Dixie Highway and Erlanger Road. Uh, the Shave and Feed store was near the community bank. The Ficky Hotel and Cafe at the corner of Commonwealth and Dixie uh, was bought by Andy Shaven and then operated until 1912. 
and the cohorts bought it and they operated it until the prohibition all right okay which would have been in the 20s yeah um, it became joe anderson's club uh in um right after that um and it was a bowling alley and uh uh, drinking and thing of that, things of that nature. Uh, lastly, it was bought by Eddie Arcaro, who was a famous jockey. And uh, he, uh, it was a popular place for a long time, uh, even when I was growing up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Kenton Hills Porcelain. It's off Dixie Highway in the area behind Johnny's Car Wash or the Thriftway, or the uh, Speedway, I'm sorry. Okay. Speedway. Everybody knows where it is. And that was operated by the Rookwood Pottery employees in the 1940s. Hmm. All right. And then uh, there are two funeral homes uh, that always stay busy, unfortunately. And uh, that's Talaferro's and Linneman. Okay, Linneman cool. Funeral Home. Yep. And both of those are still active businesses. Uh, the Cedar Grove <clears throat> Inn, excuse me, became uh, the clique home. C-L-E-E-K. It's located behind Frisch's here in Erlanger uh, on Forest Ave by Forest Avenue. And it started, it, when it started, it was a, uh, it's a real tall, it's two-story, real wide home. And it was on a 30-acre, 130-acre tract of homes on Forest Avenue and James Avenue, I believe, and perhaps um, um, a neighboring street. And um, it's currently owned by Mr. Don Thomas, who is a retired military officer uh, from the Korean War. He's a good friend of mine. Nice. Uh, it's a nice place, but you can't really see it unless you go looking right now. Right, right. It's still there. Okay. Then we have um, Colonial Cottage. Talk about a popular place. Yeah. Oh, uh, it was started in 1933. Okay. And then... Um, then it was first located next to the current building. Now the current building, which is a beautiful place, closed due to a fire. Okay. And it's currently down and it's got tarps on the roof. Uh, but we're hoping they get open soon because it's a real popular place. And I told you about the house that was what we called the annex. Well, whatever was not solved, problems not solved at the city, uh, some way, shape or form, they discussed it at the Colonial Cottage over Geta. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And uh, many things were discussed at the Colonial Cottage, either government or otherwise, and we hope and they go put again soon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did you talk to us when Erlanger was incorporated? Okay. Um, although the town's existence goes back to 1807, when Bartlett Graves was the first one to build anything here, he built a cabin, uh, the city was incorporated on uh, January 25th, uh, 1897. Mm -hmm. Interesting point, the city of Ellesmere was incorporated first. Now, it's a who's most important thing between the citizens of each community, but a lot of people don't know that Ellesmere was incorporated first. Not that it means anything, but uh, it's just an interesting fact. At the time, in uh, 1897, Erlanger population was 450 people. And as of 2019, it was 19,000 which makes it, I believe, a class one city. <clears throat> um, the city was governed by a board of trustees for 57 years uh, until 1954. And then they switched to a mayor and council type of government. Uh, the first town marshal was a gentleman by the name of um, A.J. Weiss. And first police judge was Louis Morelli. And first fire chief, believe it or not, was a shaven. Go figure. Uh, Andy Sr. was his name. Okay. Um, in 1904, the city bought a horse-drawn fire wagon, and our volunteer fire department was created. Cool. Yeah. Still in existence. It is. Fantastic. No, well, it's, a, it's not volunteer anymore. It's not volunteer. It's, no. Okay. It's, it's, it's act, a full-paid fire department, yeah. Okay. And they do a fine job. Paul, talk to us about how the library has been important to the community. All right. I can remember as a kid discovering, oh, library. Um, as, as the city developed, a group of ladies uh, formed the Erlanger Women's Club in 1914, promoting civic, uh, civic involvement. 
And the first project, their first project was the library. And uh, it opened, uh, and they had 100 books that they had borrowed from the state library in Frankfurt. And I don't know how they talked somebody into that, but they had 100 books for people to use. Um, over, the, over time, they received some financial support from the city of Erlanger and Ellesmere and Covington. Well, with financial support, that means you can do more things. Yeah. Uh, they moved to different locations trying to improve their service. And they landed, finally, that I remember, uh, in a house on Bartlett Avenue, number nine Bartlett. Everybody knows uh, Gabos was in there, and but it was a nice place. Uh, Mr. Baylor's in there now. And uh, they, uh, they stayed there for 20 years. And they did a good service. They provided library service to all of Southern Kenton County. Okay. Wow. And then they had... Um, Let's see, they had moved, and then in 1967, they gathered a bunch of signatures and a petition to get the government to create the um, Kenton County Library District, and that would include the Bookmobile. Oh, nice. And, and the Covington Library that was already in existence. Yeah. So you had a Kenton County Library District, all right, which encompassed a whole lot of area. Now, once you're a library district, of course, that gave them the, the right to collect library tax, which we see on all our bills. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's put to good use, and that supports supported their new library system here in Erlanger. Because of the new funding available, a new library was built in 1977 next to uh, the current Colonial Cottage building. And by 2002, it had outgrown itself uh, it was just busy beyond belief. And um, they moved again to a new 32,000 square foot facility on five acre track, which is off of Kenton Lands Road, mm -hmm. where it is today. Okay. And now, they have recently finished a renovation project, and um, they uh, have, it has become, because of what they've done and what they do for people, it's become the largest. One of the largest and one of the busiest, if not the busiest, library in the state of Kentucky. Paul, on that topic, let's talk about what the history of the school system the city of Erlanger has been. All right. Um, the school system is, is a history lesson in itself. Uh, Erlanger and Ellesmere uh, have worked together as cities on many projects, but uh, we think the most successful partnership was twofold. One was the consolidation of the schools from both communities into one school system, and then the desegregation of those two school, of those schools uh, over a period of time. In 19, the 1920s, they thought that the schools of both cities would improve if they were united. Um, Kentucky law at that time prohibited the creation of new school districts. So Congressman uh, A.B. Rouse and a J.C. Mills of the Kentucky Board of Education managed to get a writer in Frankfurt, a writer attached to a bill. You know how they just raise mm -hmm. it up, slide it underneath there? It's going to pass. They knew it was going to pass. So by doing that, they got the right to create an independent school district by <laughs> virtue of being a writer on that other bill, whatever that was. Wow. All right. The writer provided that a new district could be formed if it represented the community that it was going to support uh, in the amount of about 5,000 students. Okay. And uh, they did. <laughs> Thus, the Erlanger and Ellesmere Independent School District was formed. Now, they decided a new high school was needed at that time because of the, the growth of the student population. So they wanted to name it um, Lloyd after a, a John Uri Lloyd who was a man of need, okay. pardon me, a man of means. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, he had a lot of money. All right. All right, and um, they were hoping that he would uh, chip in some of that money to help with the school. Mm -hmm. Well, apparently he did, but um, they have named the school Lloyd Memorial High School, and it's still there today. After they started the school, they created a football team in the 1929-1930 uh, school year. <clears throat> And the football team did all right, and they played some games. And the Cincinnati Post uh, reported on one of their games and uh, pointed out that they, they battled like juggernauts in this game. 
um, and it stuck. And that right after that, after that article, the school chose juggernauts as their mascot. Now, an interesting fact is there is no other college or high school in the United States that has a mascot the juggernauts. I didn't know that. No. Okay. Yeah. And um, the new school uh, was a pioneer in desegregation. And um, there's the, uh, in the 1950s. In 1955, Mrs. Rosella Porterfield, uh, her maiden name was Sleet, uh, was the head teacher at the Wilkins Heights uh, school, which was the African-American school in Ellesmere. Uh, she presented to Mr. Uh, Edgar Arnett, the school superintendent, a plan to integrate the schools a few grades at a time so that it wouldn't be a big confusing mess. Right, right. So right. they did a few grades at a time. Genius. The plan was approved and it began in 1956. And it went so well that the district was featured uh, in an article on September the 17th of 1956 in Life magazine. And they were telling everyone in the United States what we were doing as a community. Hmm. And it is believed that Erlinger and Ellesmere was, School District was the first schools in the state of Kentucky to be fully integrated or desegregated. Desegregated, uh, The library uh, at the Dorothy Howell Elementary, and there's a park in Ellesmere that's named after Miss Rosa Parks. And if she is affectionately, um, um, I said Miss Rosa Parks. I think you meant. Miss Porterfield. Okay, yeah. And she is affectionately referred to as the Rosa Parks of Northern Kentucky. That's what I meant to say. That's cool. Uh, and once again, we were leading the way uh, in, with this desegregation program. I love that. Because when people think, probably around the country, which is a lot of our viewers, it's not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind. So for that to stick out, it's a beautiful highlight for Erlanger. It is. Absolutely. Yes. Talk to us about some of the events that would take place, you know, here in Erlanger that would bring folks from other communities around. Sure. Uh, apparently, they like to party here. Um, one of the uh, first community entertainment events uh, was weekend train trips to Danville. People, I guess, like to get some out and go somewhere different. Uh, people from Kentucky and Ohio would come here, like from Cincinnati, and they'd get on the train, they'd go to Danville, Kentucky. Uh, for food, fun, friends in the park, games or whatever Danville did for them down there to entertain them. But it was about the trip down and back on the train. Mm -hmm. uh, There's something different. And, uh, and then the people in Danville, of course, they would get their turn to come here for the same thing. And uh, we'd have uh, Chautauqua on the third floor of the Citizen Center down at the corner of Dixie and Donaldson. And we had... Uh, ice skating and in the winter on Silver Lake and we had dancing and music at the gazebo on Riggs Avenue and then um, let's see what else might there be um, that's about it uh, the, everybody would find something to do in the park you right know, they brought their own oh, yeah. basket their yeah. lunch basket yeah maybe the dog I don't know if I guess dogs were allowed on the train you know, so probably back then. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a horse and pig too. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a sight. <laughs> right. Um, and then um, we really progressed into big time. Uh, we had a fairgrounds and uh, the fairgrounds was located where Lloyd High School currently sits. Oh, okay. And um, the attendance at, at events over there, uh, the, apparently the, the bleachers would hold about 4,000 people and they'd fill it up. And they had pilots come here, do flyover or do trick flying or whatever. Um, they had car racing on the track. They had a half mile horse track where they ran sulkies, uh, the trots. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then a kennel club got to be real big. They started dog racing. Yeah. And for the period of racing, uh, dog racing, uh, as many as seventy-five to 80,000 people had taken part in coming here for the dog races. And I mean, in this size community, that's a lot of people. Oh, yeah. But the demise of the dog racing was caused by paramutual, paramutual betting. The gambling was illegal. Oh, I see. But it was one of those things, I don't <laughs> see nothing, you know. But yeah. uh, eventually, the paramutual, paramutual betting is what caused the dog racing to come to an end. Mm -hmm. um, all of this partying, if you will, took place between 1906 and 1925. 
Paul, talk to us about the opening of the Dixie Highway and all that that brought. Oh yeah, yeah, that that promoted partying as well. Uh, people could get it place different places, and. Uh, in 1921, like I told you, the highway was finally paved. That was the end of World War I and a flu pandemic, uh, ironic. And uh, Dixie Highway was now paved. And there was reason for everybody to be in a partying mood. Uh, Mr. Theodore Hallam organized a, a huge party, if you will, on the Dixie Highway. So they closed the highway from the Florence line, which is the Boone County line, and the center of Erlanger down by the railroad tracks, uh, and the whole street was nothing but one big party. And they, they, um, they had a um, dance floor built in the street, and they had live music, and they had uh, food, they had sing-alongs, they had, uh, oh, of course, politicians had to say their thing uh, on the, and whenever it was possible. And then uh, thousands of people were there, they say, and they, it, it's been proclaimed as the most brilliant Kenton, uh, party in Kenton County history. I can't believe there was a dance floor out yeah. on the, that's, that's yeah. crazy. Um, Heritage Day is another event that is huge in this community, and it's something that's very near and dear to us because, uh, uh, well, I'll get into it. The, the, this, it 1914, the earlier Women's Club started uh, a fundraiser, and uh, they they got a bunch of people together for a social event. Mm -hmm. On the third Sunday in September in 1990, the Women's Club was asked asked the now uh, active Erlanger Historical Society to take this function over, and so they ran it from ni from 1914 to 1990. And uh, we took it over and, and created the event that it is. And um, it was now a fundraiser for us because we had things that we wanted to promote and oh, keep yeah. going, okay? It's continued for 105 years, from 1914 to 2019. Amazing. Uh, it is. And everybody in Erlinger talks about it, and they love it, and they show up every year. Um, COVID canceled it for the last two years, unfortunately. Um, Things that go on there when we do have it is uh, again we have politicians. Politicians spoke a couple times during election years. Uh, there's lunch to be had, ice cream, crafts, dancing, music, um, hay wagon rides by horse-drawn uh, draft horses um, in the syndicate neighborhood, so people could see these homes that uh, were built here early. Yeah. Uh, they could tour the renovated depot in the museum, and we have a 1943 restored caboose on the property also that people love, kids love to climb all over it. Uh, over the years, thousands of people have come to these events. Uh, it's just amazing. And uh, it's just a beautiful day in a park with friends and family. Yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna take poetic license here and say that uh, uh, having been a lifelong resident, uh, a long, long time resident of Erlanger, uh, it's been an honor and privilege to have been a master of ceremonies or the announcer at the uh, Heritage Day celebration. I enjoyed it immensely. So how's the Erlanger Ellesmere Historical Society? So how's that linked up with the Erlanger Kentucky Railroad Depot and Museum? Okay, uh, well, um, the most important day in Erlanger history, in my opinion, or the Historical Society's opinion, it was 1869 when the Cincinnati uh, Board of Finance decided to build a railroad from Cincinnati to Chattanooga. Uh, that's when we started. And with the new depot, uh, they had to build it right through Erlanger in 1877. Excuse me, 1877, the depot and the water tower um, were built. And since the train had to stop there, we began uh, train traffic, passenger traffic. And uh, that just blossomed. In 1990, the Norfolk and Southern Railroad decided to decommission all depots from here to Chattanooga. Hmm. And we are currently the last one in existence. And that's why we turned into a museum. Uh, Mayor Fred Thomas asked the railroad if they would give us the depot instead of tearing it down. And they said yes, and but we had to move it. Well, have, with the women's club asking us to take over their role as the uh, Heritage Day people, the Erlinger Historical Society, were now the fundraisers for the event. 
So the mayor asked the historical society to come up with money to move um, the building, to save the building, to move the building, and to renovate the old building into a museum. So we had to move it back 100 feet from the railroad track okay, right. onto the park property and off of railroad right-of-way property. Wow. Okay. okay. Uh, the historical society got all kinds of donations um, from citizens and company, different companies and a bunch of different places. And uh, like I told you, it's the only remaining depot uh, on this right-of-way, railroad right-of-way. Uh, the depot closed in 1921, like I told you, about the, uh, because of COVID and um, some, they wanted to renovate the facility and make it a community center slash museum instead of strictly a museum, all right? They want the citizens to be able to use it, yeah. perhaps on the inside, yeah. uh, which all the artifacts laying out can present a problem especially if there's a lot of children. Correct. So they want to they want to set it up so it's kind of like child proof and citizen proof and nobody gets hurt that kind of thing. Yeah. So the city's currently working on that project. Um, it's open uh, the opening will we just learned maybe sometime in 2023. The Erlanger Historical Society has published two books by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have we Buffalo Trails uh, to the 21st Century and then the Ellesmere and Erlanger Historical Societies went together and produced, or public, had published uh, Ellesmere Erlanger Images of America. Now, both of these are available on Amazon. Okay. Or you can come to the uh, Historical Society meetings on Thursday evenings, every second Thursday in the month, uh, and get the book. Or you can go on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. to Ellesmere Senior Center and uh, get the books. Uh, interesting thing we need to promote is the uh, since all the folks who keep the uh, historical societies going are in fact seniors um, we need and recruit try to get people involved in the historical society no matter how old you are mm -hmm. uh, we try to find and recruit younger people yes uh, yes you all know things that we don't about our history and you may want to correct things that we have reported already and get it historically correct. And that's important, too. Uh, so come to one of our meetings every month. And uh, we serve snacks. Yes, yes, snacks are served. Drinks. And young people get involved in your historical yeah. societies. Yeah. Yes. We'll, we'll leave a light on for okay. you. Okay. All right. Yes. I love that. Okay. I love that. Paul, what a fantastic interview today. You certainly were the person to come to here for the history of Erlanger. Um, beautiful city, incredible history um, with a very lovely and promising future. Love the recruit to the young people here at the very end. Yes. It's Thank you. Smart. It was an honor. Okay. Thank you for joining us for another episode of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, here today in Erlanger, Kentucky. Paul, do think thank you so much for your time and all your great history. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Hi, my name is Paul Dusing. I'm past president and vice president of the Historic Erlanger Historical Society. With us today, we have Ed Von I, who is the current secretary for the organization. Betty Rossman is the president. Missy Andrus is our vice president, and Pat Hahn is our treasurer.